I asked you at the beginning of the service whether you're rich. And uh, let me ask you a slightly different question, okay? Do keep Hebrews 13 open in front of you. We might dance around a little bit in passages here and there. Uh, good if you're taking notes, that's great, uh, because then you can go back into it later on. Can you have enough money? Is that possible? What do we think? Give me some head nods or shakes here so I have an idea. That's the minimal British effort, isn't it? Don't even force you to put your hand up, just sort of this or this. Okay, can you have enough money? Oh, okay. Interesting, yeah? Overwhelming response that yes, you can. And the interesting thing that I have found is the more I meet people who are just overwhelmingly wealthy, the more I see, the more money you have, the less generous you can become. It's really interesting how that works out. How much money is enough money? I remember when I was a teenager, and I was watching a, a program that's on every Sunday night, um, I wasn't Christian yet, called Fantastical. And uh, you know, they show different countries and stuff, and they were showing you know, on the streets of America. The economy is so great. People throw goods that are still in working order. You know, washing machine, just got sick of it, buy a better one, put it outside in front of the house. And I was like, I wanna go there. The land where they throw away things that are still good. You know, amazing. I heard that people here just bought iPhones on contracts and just exchanged it for the better one and that sort of thing. And I was like, it's amazing, you know. And I think that that's one of the reasons why my parents were so happy for me to be able to leave Brazil, not because they didn't like me, to actually move here because they thought, this is like one of the best countries in the world. Wouldn't you say? You, fewer of you were confident of that <laughs> than you were that you can have enough money. And tonight we are challenged to think about the challenges that come, the obstacles that come when we think about money and how we feel about money. Again, in our passage, the author of Hebrews is pretty blunt in what God is commanding. Verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, I won't leave you, won't forsake you. So we say with confidence, if God is with me, I won't be afraid. And we can understand why that's a temptation today, because we live in a good economy. But what about back then? Well, if you turn back to Hebrews chapter 10, down verse 32 and onwards, if you have a look at that, you're going to see exactly what had already happened in the lives of these Christians. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Better and lasting possessions. What an encouragement. Having resisted the temptation, what is interesting that I find here is... Oh, sorry. I put stuff on slides and I just completely forget all about it. Okay. Even though they had already successfully resisted the temptation to be too attached to their possessions, in Hebrews 13, the author still says, look, you need to keep doing it. Just like in the first verse of chapter 13, you need to keep on loving. And in the same way here, you need to keep fighting against the love of money that wants to creep right back in. And you may feel as a Christian today, um, or as someone who's not a Christian, but your relationship with money is that you're not greedy. But actually here, he keeps on saying, the fight isn't one that you leave in the past. And so don't be deceived by thinking that this isn't speaking to you. And actually, where we're going to go tonight, as you can see on the screen, is that if you belong to God, to this the God of the Bible, then you have been freed by all so from all sorts of false loves, of which the love of money is one. And you have been freed by a greater love. In the love of God, there is a lot of freedom. And when we start speaking about love, love of money, love is a bit of a strong word, isn't it? We use it for all sorts of things, probably too lightly. I love dipping things in coffee. I feel strongly about that. I love peanut butter. I love my cats. I love my wife. Love is a natural kind of state and desire of our hearts. We, we are seeking for things to love all of the time, which is why the reformer John Calvin said that our hearts 
are like factories producing idols, alternatives to God that we want to worship. And if that's true, then we are in danger of giving money the podium, the place, the first place that only deserves, that only God deserves. But what do I mean by love of money? I'm going to hazard a guess here, and you tell me later on if you agree or not. But loving money is when our attitudes, our motivations, our decision-making, essentially our heart in the biblical sense, the kind of control center of our being, is guided by trying to fulfill a God-shaped need with money. Or in other words, it's putting our security in what we can own. And I think the result of that is utter heartbreak. Because if we put on something else what only God can give, we're going to be disappointed and frustrated and sad and angry. Well, like C.S. Lewis said, we're going to be people who could be having a holiday at the sea, but we just want to play with mud instead and we content ourselves too easily. And in loving money, we make a huge mistake, don't we? Money is meant to serve us to be used in our service to God and instead we beg money to serve our needs. And I think what's striking about loving money is if that's something you do, then you can't ever say you have money. It's more like money has you under its control. You know, you're constantly making decisions just based on how much you can still have at the end of it. And there are dangers in that. We're going to talk about a few of these dangers, but here are just two quick ones. The first danger oh, is, you know, if you're someone who can say, yeah, I'm loaded, I'm rich, you know, I've got enough is that you can think, because I earn this much, fill in the blank with however many thousand, okay, you earn a year, six figures, whatever, I don't know. Some of you look like you earn six figures. And you might think, I don't need to worry about stuff because I have this much money. And it's not until God allows some of that foundation to be shaken, some of that money to be away, for you to develop ME and not be able to work, or some other uncertainty about the future that you realize your sense of security and control was just an illusion. God was the only one you could have trusted all along. But the second danger is this. If you're someone who would say, well, I'm broke, you know, I'm not on the good side of rich, then your temptation might be to say, well, my life would be sorted, though, if I could have this much money. Because the love of money promises to us a safe place or pleasure with what you can buy with it or joy. And it's easy to see why we want to love it, why we want to give it the place that only God deserves to have. Just this month, we uh, have been thinking about whether if we're ever approved to adopt, which might be decided next month, we're kind of like, oh, maybe should we? We might have a year or not before um, they place children with us if they say yes. Should we try and buy a house? Like, you know, there's this whole stamp duty thing going on right now, or not going on as the case may be. Like, should we do that? And then we're freaking out. Have we got enough savings? Um, maybe we should have saved more. And then we're like, man, you know, if we hadn't given this much money away, then we could have saved. Um, if we had actually, instead of got, getting married, uh, just lived together, we could have saved this much money. Or if we, all sorts of like thoughts that have nothing to do with anything godly. And you get worried and your heart starts racing and you can feel like things are getting out of control and you get anxious. The love of money can creep in our hearts just like that and we end up comparing ourselves with people who do have this much money or whatever it is you know these, these really annoying people who at a, at a very young age they're like 20 something and they buy a house and i'm like oh, you know what i mean and you end up envying well i'm not bitter at all that's what the love of money can do make you bitter resentful and so it's therein then that the most helpful thing I can do or that you, brother or sister, can do for me is to shout back at me the truths of God's word, the truths about God's character that we're going to see here this evening. Because it is only God who actually gives us what we are longing for, what money, the love of money is promising. Because here are two lies and a truth for you. One lie is this. The love of money would want to say your identity, who you are, is in what you own or what you can own. Because see, if you're broke, you can still kind of put all of your identity in potentially having this someday. That's how most people feel about living. Uh, if they're from a developing country like mine, Brazil, then that's how they feel about living in a first old country. Well, if only I could live in the UK. I mean, even the welfare system pays more than what we get paid here. 
and they think my life would be sorted. Listen to this passage uh, here in Luke chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replies, man, who appointed me a judge and an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So your life, your living isn't about, can't be about what you own, what you can afford, how you can dress. And the proof of that is that if your goal in life is to live comfortably, that can very soon be turned on its head, can't it? How many people don't we know that their main goal in life was to get rich and they got an illness and they couldn't progress in their career anymore? Something else happened. They had a baby at an unexpected time and that put a big full stop on their career. If that's the life goal, then life is over. Jesus goes on to explain in the parable, this rich dude has an awesome harvest and he thinks, I'm going to build bigger barns. And then he thinks, well, you know, because I have enough, I have plenty, I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. And he discovers that with God, none of these things matter. And Jesus says that God would say to that man, fool, you haven't built anything with God. You are not rich towards God. Therefore, most of your life was built on sinking sand. You haven't built for eternity. And so we, if we build our identity instead, in what the author of Hebrews says, which is to know that you belong to God, you are in his hands, and no one can take you out if you belong to him, that is a much more secure foundation than money that comes and goes. But here's the second lie. Your future is in your hands. I mean, highly successful people that I know um, would trust in money to say, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to make plans, five-year, ten-year plans, with some sort of certainty in my heart that it's going to happen because I'm in charge. And I've also found that they tend to be, in time, very anxious people when things come to rock their world a little bit. And as I said before, that kind of little undercurrent of worry and anxiety becomes a full-on tsunami of, I thought I was in control, but I discovered that I'm not. And here is the truth. Loving money actually leads to pushing God away. Notice I'm not saying having money, saving money, being prudent with money, but loving it. Giving it that place that only God has. Read this with me. If God demands our all, we're going to read in 1 Timothy 6 in a minute, then if he demands our all, every inch of our lives that we don't give becomes an inch that we move away from him and we don't get to enjoy him. Here's 1 Timothy 6. Those who want to get rich, love of money, fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people who are eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And I think the feel of that passage is saying to us, putting our possessions first, or what we can own or earn first, produces in us a, a lifestyle that not only dishonors God, but actually leads us really, really away from Him. And you don't have to think too far in the Gospels, but you remember Judas, who loved money and didn't want to part from it, judged the woman who sacrificed um, expensive perfume and said this was a waste when Jesus actually said that was a beautiful thing. In a similar way, we can envy what other people have, we can be discontent with God's plan for us, with the skills he's given us, with the families he's given us. And essentially, we can end up saying, okay, the Bible says you're sovereign, but you got my life wrong. You should have given me gifts and skills X, Y, Z, and I should have been born enough to a family that earns this much and can provide this much for me. And slowly but surely, that can lead us to a pattern of resentment, of bitterness against the people that we envy, but against God. And we don't even realize that we are doing it. That's why the author of Hebrews is saying, look, even though you've been fighting this for a long time, keep it up. And the best way to fight it 
The best way to fulfill the command, be content, is to think, what is the greater love than the love of money? Let's talk about that. Because I think it's, this greater love is encapsulated in be content with what you have. Why? Because the God you have is better than any false security that the love of money can give. And I think we are doing that all the time, moving towards a greater love. Um, ever since I moved into this country, I became very content with, you know, the very kind of base things. I'm like, man, Morrison's, everything that you can buy for like 30p, 40p, 50p, donuts, you know, I mean, I go into, uh, I've, I've said the name of the supermarket, I shouldn't do that, I, I don't know how to prevent, they're not paying me anything. Anyway, another supermarket that has a really good pastry, you know, counter, where you can buy, like, for a couple of quid, you can get seriously fat, it's really good, you know, your arteries can clog for not much money. And the more I ate, the more I progressed in my palate matured, the more my love of the 60p donut over here was exchanged by the love of something a little bit more sophisticated. And if you gave me the choice, I'm willing to say, forget that. I'll pay five quid for this one, no problem. Because my taste bud is just yearning for it, okay? I think it's natural for us. I got married, I was very happy with Henry. Corded Henry, hovering everywhere, British, no problem. And I met Dyson. It was love at first sight, okay? My pockets were emaciated, but it's, you know, I have a cordless vax. If you're watching and you belong to any of these companies, I am taking any commission, you know? I've moved on. I mean, some of you, I remember this from before lockdown. It's some people in this church, when we have, we have a lunch for those who are um, a little bit more mature, been, been on the road uh, for a bit longer than me. And do you know what's on the menu for that lunch? Spam. In today's modern world, they have a choice. But the greatest love, spam. And I think immediately, the, the, my stomach burns. <laughs> you know, it's, oh, sorry, in Portuguese is stomach burn. In English is heartburn, isn't it? Heartburn, you know? Stomach burn makes much more sense. That's what happens. Anyway, we're constantly moving from the lowest loves to the higher ones. And what the author of Hebrews is going to say is, listen, you are tempted by the love of money. Let me, let me show you. Money promises that you will feel secure, safe, you'll have everything you need. Give it a few months, give it a few years, you'll be frustrated, you'll be depressed. I guarantee it. Even if it takes all of your life and you're in your 70s and you think, you look back, I built nothing towards the place where I'm going, or not going as the case may be, but here he says, and we read it again, the root of being content. You have God. He has said, money will leave you, sure. Fickle friends will replace with any other idol. But God, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And that makes me say with confidence, if the Lord is my helper, I don't have to be afraid Not when my pockets are empty, when I'm worried about um, where the stamp duty is going to affect my prospects, whether I'm ever getting on the property ladder or whatever else you feel, whether you can leave enough for your grandchildren. Because I have him and he never changes. And so this love gives us lots of things, amongst which a greater perspective, which I've already kind of started speaking about. When we love money, we're constantly worried about having enough and whether our investments are going to have greater returns or not. You know, some of you who invest, I'm too afraid. But when we love God, we are content because eternity is always more valuable than right now. And one of the Psalms that is closest to my heart is Psalm 73. Because it reminds me that I'm not the only one to struggle with saying to God, God, you should have given me more. And I know that's a favorite for some of you as well, because I was talking to at least one of you in the past. And in uh, verse 12 of Psalm 73, it reads... This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They go on amassing wealth. What good is it being a Christian then? All we get is suffering, people judge us. And then he says in verses 16 to 20, when I tried to understand all this, he's mulling it over. It troubled me that other people have such good lives till I entered the sanctuary of God. He goes to church and he understands this. 
their final destiny. The person who doesn't have the God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, life is like that, a vapor, a dream. What are we truly building? So my envy dissipates when I remember that and I have the bigger picture. We have to remind ourselves of this because I, for one, am tempted to think, over the last five years, I've spent several thousand pounds on visas. I don't know why the Home Office wanted to charge me so much just to tick a box and say, he's good enough, he can live here. I mean, we even had to prove that our relationship wasn't a sham by having lots of letters of friends, family, and acquaintances. And I'm like, I've given you all the letters. Why do you want 1,500 pounds for every two and a half years? Anyway, if you're watching, I really appreciate the work that you put into my visa application. But that's the reason why when you go on holiday, you don't redecorate your holiday cottage if you're a sane, normal person. You don't redecorate your hotel room because you know that that's temporary. And so you're okay with the fact that the little kettle that they give you is an absolute laugh and fits one or two teacups, you know, whatever it is. You're okay with that. It's temporary. You don't have to go to the shop and buy one and bring it over. You have a greater perspective. Loving God more leads to a greater joy, a greater satisfaction in Him. Judas pierced himself with many griefs. He's a signpost of what happens when we love money more than God and we feel only our shame at the end of life or at the end of the day. But God, and trust in Him, I can never lose it. I have exactly what I should have. I am exactly what I... Uh, I, have exa I own exactly what I should own and I am exactly what I need to be in order for God to be able to work in my heart and make me more like Christ. And that can make me content. He then quotes that, that quote that we've read before, and it actually comes from Deuteronomy, Moses' um, retirement speech, where he's passing the baton to Joshua. And it says this, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake, nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. They're just about to go to battle against the Canaanites. And God reassures them. You're going to battle. You're going to feel fear and anxiety. But I will be there with you. And tomorrow when you, who are sitting here tonight, you trust in Jesus, but you're struggling because you are worried about your future, someone else's future that you love. Just as God said in Deuteronomy 31, the battle is coming, but I'll be with you. In the same way he's saying, I will still teach you and make you more like Christ through this difficulty. You can trust me. I mean, think of the person that is closest to you right now. There might be a friend, there might be a spouse, there might be a neighbor, whoever, whoever is closest to you. What has been the biggest tension that you've experienced in your relationship, the biggest point of friction that you've experienced in your relationship? Think about that right now. Maybe it might be a friendship, it might be a, a, a spouse, parent, child. Was it maybe a huge lie that you told them made them really mad? Was it maybe that you failed them by speaking behind their back? Was it saying something in anger that you just couldn't take back? Was that maybe the highest point of tension? For those of you who are teenagers here, do you know why it is that it's so much easier for you to shout at your parents than at your friends? Have you ever thought about that? Like, for you to, like, say something nasty to your parents than, than to your friends. Do you know why that's easiest? It's because you know they love you. It's really interesting. I've always known as a teenager that if I say to my friends what I really think at any point in time, well, they might walk off. They might quit the friendship. My parents could never do that. So I can lay it into them. Interesting, a relationship that can then survive that tension when you get to the other side is stronger, more trusting, more loving. I don't want to assume that every relationship gets to the other side, but here in the Bible, the author of Hebrews is saying, you irk God all day long. You sin against him. You behave as if you still were his enemy sometimes. Don't trust him. I do that. And yet, unlike all of the relationships we just thought about, this is one where he says, never will I leave you. 
never will I forsake you. No amount of tension that a sorry won't mend. That's a huge, huge encouragement for me as a Christian. No other relationship is like that. And I love the fact that when it says, never will I leave you, that you is singular. It's just like you, personal. Let me be personal with you. You, Tiago, I will never leave you if you trust in me. And so we want to speak the word of God back to ourselves. And as we uh, get into this closing section, let's think about a couple more things. One is I should be able to always remind you, not just because I'm the assistant pastor, because I'm a Christian brother. And you should be able to remind each other and me of at least these two things, that we should have a greater perspective, that we have greater joy in the love of God, that God is always more precious, and therefore we want to fight for him. Here's something that Amy Carmichael said in one of the uh, poems that she wrote. Here's one stanza. This greater love, who understands God is more precious, is able to say, Lord, I am willing to receive what you give. I'm content. Lack what you withhold to relinquish what you take. Because you know what? The more we are willing to do these things, the more we find that God really truly is precious to us. Why is it, I sometimes wonder, that the most joyful people I know are people who are constantly in the service of others? I think it's because they found the great contentment in having Christ and so they are willing to give of their time, of their money. And they find greater joy because they feel near to the God who loved them in the way that they are trying to love others now. So God is more precious. But also that God uses our idols to show us that he alone is enough. And I think every time there's a little something trying to creep up into God's first place in my heart, God always gives me some questions to ask that help me to unmask that. For example... I might want to learn to ask, O oh God of contentment, can you show me by your spirit, where am I being ungenerous right now? With my time? With my emotions? With my money? And don't think that because perhaps you might, you're a child or you're a teenager and you don't get, you know, some of you have different family agreements, some of you get pocket money um, for doing stuff, some of you, you know, just slave away but you don't get anything. You get a roof over your heads in love with your parents. That's not nothing. Um, and you might think, well, because I don't get money regularly, I can't give. Why not? Whatever money you might already have in the bank account, you can give to the blessing of another. You might want to learn to ask, God who will never leave me, what blessing in Christ do I need to remember now? My God who is a sovereign, providential God, what area of my life Am I being really bitter about now? Can you show me? Show me where there is maybe resentment against you, or where there is maybe envy um, over what someone else has. Show me where I'm being ungenerous, whether I feel like I'm loaded or whether I'm broke. Finish with this thought. The last quote in our Bible passage. Do you see where it's from? Another Psalm, Psalm 118. A psalm where, in verse 6 and 7, it said, The Lord is with me. I'm not going to be afraid. He's my helper. What can me and Malthus do to me? Okay, great. God is so big that this psalmist, if you glance at it, has been able to say, I'm surrounded by enemies. I'm surrounded by difficult things that I don't like happening around me. And the reason why I can be content is, I cried out, and the Lord heard and freed me. You and I can know that if tonight God is speaking to you about an idol that's taking first place in your heart, that you don't want to let go of, by quoting Psalm 118, he's saying, you also can cry out, and the Lord can free you from that, and therefore you won't need to be afraid. So there we have it. We are freed from all sorts of false loves, and the love of money is one of them. From that bitterness, that resentment, because we're able to say, God has given me everything I need for life and godliness. And we are freed by a greater love that gives us a greater perspective and a greater joy. My prayer for you is that you would be able to say, do you know what? 
I'm not perfect. I need a lot of help in this area. Brother, sister, can you pray with me? I've done that with some of you <laughs> this week um, as God spoke with me through the word. Let's take a moment now just to speak to God about perhaps areas in our lives where we are ungenerous because we want to be like the way that he is with us. Take a moment to pray. Dear Father, it is um, hard to pray seriously when there is an ice cream van outside. But <laughs> we are so glad. Your love is gracious. It's abounding. It's giving. You just give again and again. Not only in what we need to eat, our daily bread, but in the grace that we need in order to be actually content and to be able to say, you know what? Thank you, Lord. You've given me the gifts that I need. You've given me the body that I need that I can be content with. And sometimes it's hard, Father, to be content with the minds that we have. Sometimes they don't work properly. With the bodies that we have, sometimes we'd love for parts of our body to be larger, smaller, of a different shape. Please, will you help us to know if we have you, we have everything that we need. And only you, Holy Spirit of God, can persuade us in our hearts of that. We pray that you would do that, please. So that we wouldn't covet anything else that only you can give. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.